Alrighty, some of you may know that I've been sponsoring or have started sponsoring a uh, writing competition of both HFY and Humans of Space Orcs. The first one on Humans of Space Orcs has finished and a winner has been chosen. This video is a showcase of the stories that entered. I hope that you enjoy. Remember that there will be another competition this month and the month after that, and there is no barrier to entry. Anyone can enter. There are certain rules and themes and the like depending on the subreddit, but everyone has a chance. I personally have no say in who wins. So, yeah, it's all up to the community on both of the subreddits. I urge you to join both and read or write the stories in the competitions for the month and help the communities grow. Let's head on to the stuff that you're actually here for. The stories, in no particular order, mind you. A quick thank you to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Dark Machine, Estrella the Dreamer, Mesic, Pudic Yol, and Casper Arnholtz. Thank you very much. Anyways, a not unfamiliar author to this channel, Rosie013, entered the following story. Which, on a personal note, was really fucking weird to read. Not bad weird, just weird weird. You'll find out at the end. Anyways, strange demands. First contact with extraterrestrial life did not go as expected for humanity. There was no accidentally running into a survey ship in the void. No, we come in peace moment. Not even an awkward exchange of fire before belatedly realizing neither side wanted to fight. Although, in hindsight, that may have been preferable. No, a dozen spaceships suddenly appeared in low orbit one day without warning. Large, silvery discus that looked like something straight out of a 1960s UFO tale. And did nothing. At least, nothing that we could discern. While the people of Earth rioted and prayed, governments bickered over whose jurisdictions this belonged to, and military men shared uneasy looks while hastily revising plans. Eventually, as all things do, people calmed down. The panic of unexpected contact fizzling out in an unsatisfactory inaction. Yes, there were now aliens, but no one knew anything beyond wild conjecture, and they didn't appear to be hostile. Just inert. Life had almost returned to normal when they reached out and shattered the peace for a second time in as many weeks. The language that was not words yet still conveyed meaning boomed out a demand straight into the inner ear of every human in the entire galaxy. Give us your squirrels! And on the planet below, a startled and very confused population began rioting anew. What? Did the demand mean? Why this one animal in particular? Do they want all the squirrels? Do we just round them all up? How do we give them the truly disembodied voice? What kind of technology lets them contact everyone at once? If they can understand us, then there must be a way for us to reach out to them. We should ask for clarification. Why should we give up our own to alien demands? I say we fight! And around the world, arguments went making exactly no progress. Strangely enough, it was a new apocalyptic-focused religious group that made the first headway with the odd demand. Mad with fear, driven by religious zealotry, they had begun to round up every squirrel they could. Live catch traps were set, pet stalls and zoos across the world were raided, even farms were being set up to make sure that there would be enough animal offerings to appease our now alien overlords. Desperate people joined them in droves, unhappy with their governments paralyzed in action. Law enforcement tried their best to stop the madness, but they had their hands full with the global scale rioting. Just as the captured squirrels began to breed to a point where there would soon be the largest cage population of any animal ever in human history, the aliens spoke once more. No, give us your aggressive ones. As the cultist farmer sang hymns to the sky in joy at this new commandment, the tattered few governments that had managed to retain some sense of semblance wondered what new madness this latest message meant. How does one determine the aggressiveness of a squirrel? Boldness in seeking food, fighting when in heat, competition for nesting space. Most of humanity was left literally scratching their heads as the, uh, well... 
alien demand. But not the cultists. If you couldn't measure the aggressiveness of a squirrel, you just had to make them more aggressive. The farms became nightmarish laboratories, as resources were limited to drive competition, and the vile survivors of these brutal conditions were pumped with drugs and crossbred. In just a few generations, they were barely recognizable as the animals of their ancestors were, replaced with steroid-fueled, unnatural monsters. Entire ecosystems were in danger of a breeding population of such things as scape. The most extreme pinnacle of bulk aggression were practically worshipped by the desperate creators, hoping to be noticed by their gods above. And notice they did. Ghouls, give us the seer! Oi, give me the mic! Oh, no, fuck off with that. I know what I'm doing. Give me the mic. Give it to me. <clears throat> Tra translation error. Sorry. We want to speak to your all-knowing seer. Uh, you're an aggressive squirrel. We uh, mean no harm. We, we just seek to know how they so accurately recount the parts of our galaxy's history that your species has no ways to otherwise know about. And, um... Ask about the stories that we assume to be predictions of the future. Please, um, we hope to learn under their guidance. While humanity collectively stared at the spaceships in awed disbelief, a single YouTube commentator shook his head in amusement and presented himself to the nearest UFO for temporary abduction. It was time to clear up the whole mess. End of story. Entry number two. Skeletal Hell, written by Father Bernard. A rattling echo booms through the dull caves, specks of dust falling from the crevices above, illuminated from the rays of light. Those were the visual senses that were first bestowed upon me as I awakened from my slumber. My mind completely shattered into more pieces than there were stars of the galaxy. Nonetheless, I continued to survey my surroundings. A few paces away from where I rested was a lake of the purest water one could lay their eyes upon. Intrigued by this, I forced myself onto my two feet, shaking and struggling against my own mass, my energy deprived legs giving out as soon as I reached the body of liquid, almost too conveniently. Rays of light pierced through the clear mass of liquids like bullets, illuminating the glistening lake to appear as though it was gifted from the divine powers themselves. I took a gander at my reflection, and even if I did have vocal cords, I couldn't say that I would have been able to admit much words. I was devoid skin, muscle, blood, or any exterior properties of your typical biological organism. I was a skeleton. This revelation lasted longer than I could anticipate as I was in complete awe as the sight myself. I used my bone digits to explore every nook and cranny of my skeletal being, reaching into places I never before could with thick walls of flesh blocking my path. Alas, the expedition of myself would have to remain on standby, as the echoing sounds of a bony stampede plagued the cave system. I was splashed with a feeling of impending danger, and I quickly forced my way, standing upright once again, this time with less of a struggle. I looked around for possible escape routes, but to no avail. I was cornered. However, there were plenty of stones around, perfectly fit for throwing and bashing. Fight or flight, it was just a matter of given circumstances. I readied myself and briefly awaited what followed. My mind stretched the seconds to minutes, to hours even, but to my surprise, what I assumed was hustling crowded creatures was instead a single menacingly tall skeleton, though, peculiarly, it didn't belong to that of a human. The skeleton instead resembled a hexapod, yet it stood upright on its back four legs. Its front remaining two limbs were used as arms rather than legs, and had three manipulators accompanying an opposable thumb on each hand. Its cranium was flat and circular. It had four gloomful eye sockets devoid of light. Its jaw was slanted downwards just slightly, and by all means, it was gargantuan. A whole three heads taller and four torsos thicker than me. The beastly skeleton had equipped a slick black halberd, 
and an emblem resembling a tree branch was etched deeply into the center of the shaft. Its attention was fixated right unto me. The lone feeling of being set as a target engulfed me, and as it let out a hell-breaking screech, charged at me, closing the distance quicker than I could have expected. It raised the halberd above its head and swung down upon me with an axe end. I somehow narrowly avoided the attack. Of course, I had no room to celebrate as it swiftly followed through with a lunge on the spear end of the shaft. I quickly adapted and was already expecting this. I was able to dodge to the side while making room for the counter in addition. Its head was greatly exposed, so I took the opportunity to raise my hand and strike it directly in the face with a stone, cracking its maxillia into the dust. In agony, the beast backed away, but not without vengefully raising the spear upward in a swift motion during the process, slicing at my left eye, leaving a mark to forever remind me of this confrontation. The beast was now on guard. I couldn't afford to risk a close quarters combat anymore. I lifted another dense stone off the ground, winding up and launched the projectile at the beast. I narrowly missed my target. In fact, it passed right through the area where its skin would have been if it not for the fact it was devoid of such. Clearly, seeking vengeance for its embarrassing failure, the beast made a desperate and ill-conceived charge at me. I quickly scrambled for another stone. This time, I'd be concentrating on the target I planted on its already damaged face. Only a sure weak point created by yours truly. I launched a stone perfectly this time, so perfect. Even I had a hard time believing the human structure was capable of such. And, as expected of such a throw, the beast's skull was devastated, snapping right off at the spine like a toothpick. Its head tumbled into the lake similarly to a guillotine victim. Its scream was unprecedented and ghouly. The sound upon impact resembled that of a wrecking ball annihilating a wall that dared to stand in its path. The emotional aftermath would be described similarly to Sour Patch, except both came ghastly confusion, then relief and triumphancy. I won't perish until I figure out what exactly is happening, and my own accord, I remarked. Recovering my balance, I started to strut to the remains of the slain beast, eager to analyze it closer, but came to an awkward halt when I nearly slipped on something peculiar. The halberd it was wielding, a fine work of human craftsmanship for sure, definitely stolen by the beast, but uh, something began resonating within me upon merely inspecting the weapon. The swinging was uh, deja vu. My goal being that simple internal and external discovery, curiosity is bound to follow anyway. That being said, foolishly thinking no harm could be done, I lifted up the halberd by the shaft and caressed it in awe of its beauty. Suddenly, a memory returns to me, drilling painfully into my brain as a short but shattering recollection. This was most confusing as I did not even have organs. Then, again, I should have questioned how I was able to move, let alone think, without any such. But upon the analysis of the memory, I discovered this halberd used to be mine. In my memory, I recall sitting upon some sort of altar... I was wearing an ink-black hooded medieval-style robe with milk-white trims at the end of the sockets, pristine tungsten armor underneath, with one left shoulder piece visible above the robe, but most importantly of all, flesh was present on me. I couldn't inspect my face at all, as this was my first-person memory. However, I do recall feeling that scar worn out flesh upon me, apart from what I felt it saw. I could remember the smell. The smell of fresh, flowing blood, reaching out from the far rear of me. Yet I refused to acknowledge it. It implored me, beckoned me to look at what I'd done, relentlessly stabbing me in the spine with an emotional landslide consisting of a great sensation of regret and dread, nearly causing me to lose myself. But like a miracle, something saved me from this hell residing within me pulling me up from the depths of the graceful rope of awareness. My mind had returned to this realm. A single water droplet made its simple, uninterrupted path from the ceiling to the smooth, bony peak of my forehead. I was in utter disbelief, yet I knew I just couldn't waste any more time. 
I hadn't even begun to explore these eerie caves, and I knew I probably wouldn't finish any time soon. Receive transmission. Playback. Is it done? No. Hard to tell if it will ever be. Results have plateaued, and attempting to have the Council reach a consensus is proving to be futile. Listen, I bestowed upon you the resources and time to properly orchestrate the procedure. I have personally impeded the attempted obstructions of your work from those pesky adversaries, and I have even provided you and your team with exemplary protection from TH-42 with unprecedented prowess. You have been well endowed with these benefits and working standards, so what could have possibly obstructed your progress? The specimen's being experimented on. Have me transported to the specimen. Receive transmission concluded. Tremoring thunder fills the surrounding cave walls. Rain bounds down relentlessly from the outside. A cyan tinted light beams through the cave's exit, a mere four meters away from me. I have lost my will to count the days I have been confined within these caves after the 365th mark, each individual one representing 24 Terran hours. From that remark alone, it is easy to infer that I have regained most of my knowledge pre-mortem. With that out of the way, I knew there was only one way to go, and that was forward. I would leave these damned caves behind, and I was confident that I would be showered with feelings of relief as I knew that every corner of these caverns had been thoroughly inspected. But as I made my predetermined path to the end of the illuminated tunnel, I stopped for one last contemplation. I had only received knowledge about myself. My own memories have nothing to do about what dreadful things could possibly lurk out there. Just from my experiences alone within these caves, I'm sure whatever lies out there couldn't be any better than what resided within here. These caverns were littered to the brim with animated skeletal remains of fallen sapiens, some even belonging to humans such as myself. I would have assumed that being fellow sapiens, they would have considered a more diplomatic approach to our first encounters. But no, that would be just too damn convenient, right? Every single individual here had lost their damned sanity, and simply wouldn't hesitate to bear their fangs at you. Make bone meal out of you. Dismantle and commission your bodily structure into their twisted jewelry collection. <sighs> I digress. I took a step forward, testing my will, then decided there was no returning. The wind howls restlessly as the skeleton emerges from the dreadful caves. Following the skeleton's said emergence was the awakening of a new era of hell itself. End of story. Story number three. Ghosts of the Void, written by way of Wisdom LBW. I was assigned to lead a secret research station, not within any galaxy. Those who knew that stations like this existed called us Void Dwellers. We reported to Supreme Commander Direct to ensure complete secrecy. The construction of these stations was erased from all wrinkles. Some of the researchers on my station joked that we were the ghosts of the void. I was originally supposed to only know about ten of these stations, but due to a slip of the tongue, a researcher visiting our neighbor station was talking about news from the eleventh station that I didn't know about before. It was around this time of the Sertari rebellion that our research took a strange turn. We'd been testing some new weapons that could subdue rebels without killing them as a dead slave produces no value, and we needed the extra economic power to outcompete other human empires and the filthy Xenos. While we were testing gases and their effects on the mind, there was a leak, and some of the researchers started hallucinating and acting terrified of things not there. I had them quarantined in Medical Bay. But then, I saw it. The walls began to shift, and I suddenly was aware that we were not alone in the void. Whatever we were testing opened the human mind to see beyond the normal visual range, and hear beyond the normal audio range. What I saw was beyond description, but it had multiple wing-like appendages jutting out at strange angles and eye-like spots on its body like a Dalmatian. It was some bizarre color best described as burning bronze. It told me telepathically, Do not be afraid and then proceeded to tell me that he was concerned about me, 
and the human group that I was a part of. It informed me that um, humans are always fighting at the slightest instigation. We tried to guide humanity towards a better future. But your species is stubborn and corrupt beyond belief. It offered to guide me towards the truth as the effects of the gas wore off, and I was returned to a normal state of being. I was panicking a little, as I knew this could qualify as a thought crime if it was discovered. But I began thinking about it and realized that these hallucinations were a threat. I knew that the order was more important than the truth, and if these things wanted to disrupt the order that the Supreme Commander had established, we would need to destroy them. I ordered a change in our research focus and proceeded to find a dosage that gave humans the best and clearest view of the creatures with the least side effects. Thankfully, it only took two insane researchers and ten mentally broken test subjects to get it right. It is rare to get an audience with the Supreme Commander, much less in person, but I had made a case for the need of top secrecy and dire urgency. I took a dose of the gas before the meeting to make sure one of the other dimensional beings was present before gassing the meeting room. One of the bodyguards fired a gun at the creature with the laser and bullets passing through it, while my escort began to strangle me. Thankfully, the Supreme Commander ordered them not to kill me. I was unable to focus on the discussion that took place with the creature, as I still had my head in a vice-like grip from the escort. After a short time, I was released and the Supreme Commander appointed me as the head researcher of over a hundred void research stations. We started by installing the gas to let us see beyond normal human perception on every station. It drove some researchers mad. But humans are nothing if not persistent and resilient. Being able to see and talk to the creature of the void allowed us to advance our knowledge of medicine considerably. But we hid the fact that we were trying to find a way to kill them as best we could. In the meantime, we were able to develop weapons that worked on xenobiology without affecting humans which came in handy during border disputes that turned into a skirmish causing the xenos to back off their colony claim. The first clue that the Void Creatures had discovered our true goal was the destruction of the research station that had been making the most breakthroughs towards killing them. I went over the recordings and found the Eldritch Killer weapon that the station had developed shortly before its destruction. I sent the schematics to each station and the result was a success. We lost 10 stations but killed or wounded about 300 of them and those that were not destroyed left the station. If they ever returned, we would be ready for them. Those creatures that invoked so much terror in us now fled from us in terror. I could now turn to my personal project of becoming the Supreme Commander myself. This journal is presented to the Internal Security Department to justify the assassination of lead scientist Redacted in charge of Project Void Slayer and the reallocation of funding towards Ghosts of the Void. End of story. Story number four. A Rise of Lonely Souls, written by Senabia Vagansky. We were small once, afraid, afraid of dying, afraid of losing our loved ones, afraid of being alone. So we created gods to explain what we did not understand, to reassure ourselves that there was someone out there, someone looking over us. Even then, we traveled over the next hill, over the river, or the plains, the mountains, the valleys, to learn what was out there, to find others. Yet, no matter how much we prayed, tragedy still struck. No matter who we met, they were just as lonely and afraid as we were. We were alone. Little by little, we cast our gods away in pain. Step by step, every human could reach any other. And still, we were alone. Still, we were afraid. So we looked to the stars. There had to be more people out there. More places to see. More souls to connect to. We called out in hope, shouting into the darkness for someone to respond. Anyone... No response came. 
We flung ourselves into the void, uncaring of the withering of our forms and the harshness outside our mother planet. If we just persevered, if we just tried hard enough, sacrificed enough, we'd find them. We wouldn't be alone. We mastered our star and found no one. Improved our frail bodies to keep looking, keep traveling, keep trying. Star after star we touched. Other life was even found microscopic, early still taking its very first steps. We were still alone. Before long, the limit of our forms was reached. Despite our best attempts, our vessels, now viable for more than ten times longer than nature ever gave us, had reached their limits. For the first time, we turned inwards. Was this truly all we could hope for? All our work, all our sacrifice, all our hope, and still to suffer? To lose, to grasp where the great beyond and be found wanting. To still forever be alone. Nay, though it was preposterous, we'd conquered the seas of our home. Though it was preposterous, we'd soar through the skies above our heads. Though it was preposterous, we reached towards the heavens to streak past where we once believed the gods of Eld lived. Though... It was preposterous. We'd find a way to become our own god. To travel beyond. To not be alone. Machines, the science of planets. Hunting for the very fabric of reality. Uncountable lifetimes of work stripping nature bare. To learn every last secret. Journeys within the universe of our own minds. Cataloging, accounting for, and learning the very meaning of self finding ways of applying those together, entire new branches of knowledge flourishing with the enthusiasm for discovery. Finally, we'd done it. Through will, energy, and prayer, the first real god of humanity was born, Eshtart. After uncountable lives of suffering and loneliness, one of our very first gods was now real, living human. Despite their new form, the first true god still remembered all of the lessons, all of the joy and suffering, all of the loss. And so they guided others to join him, one by one. More humans shed their mortal shells, taking place beside a start in eternity. The gates of heaven now lay open, previously unthinkable journeys trivial to beings which time could no longer touch. The gods set forth, soaring through the cosmos once more. They saw life flourishing, orb after orb filled with creatures to discover, spread throughout their home galaxy. Yet all of them were young, far too young to have minds of their own. When the birthplace had been fully explored, the species which had surpassed every barrier of nature in search of companionship faced the harsh truth. They was simply too early. They were alone. All of humanity had was humanity itself. The gods watched as life slowly caught up with them, the sparks of life igniting over and over in countless worlds. Their own story played in front of them. The distant and beautiful peoples learning to teach, learning to plant, learning to... Uh, to pray. They were praying... They were afraid, afraid of dying, afraid of losing their loved ones, afraid of being alone. We could not bear it. We could not let countless more lives be lost to pain and fear. We could not let thousands upon thousands of years of tragedy play themselves all over again. So we became not just gods, but their Gods, real gods, protecting them, guiding them, teaching them, loving them. We were alone, but they would not be. Lady Ashtart, Lady Ashtart, one of the myriad of diminutive beings sitting in the ground raised a limb, waving the tip in excitement. Yes, young one. The god, the human, smiled gently at the alien while hovering in the atmosphere of the stadium. Inexplicable strings of light holding her aloft. Will you 
be taking care of us too, it asked innocently. If you allow us, of course, this galaxy is not our home, but life is precious everywhere. And uh, you are not, and never will be, alone. End of story. Story number five. Persistence and Ambush, written by Brain Crab. I slipped the mag revolver back into its holster and tacked it close, making sure that the faux leather clasped it securely. A poor choice for this job, given the chances to miss at this distance and possibility he was shielded. I gripped the railing I hung from tighter, as I twisted my back parallel to it and wrapped my legs around the bars for stability. My other hand snaked across my back, tracing the blade sheath whipping the rain from the polymer's surface. As it reached the handle, I snapped the hand shut, stopping the feel for a moment. Genuine homeworld, fine, smooth to the eyes and slickened by rain, yet unmoving in my hands. It had cost me a fortune, cost others their lives, and I owed it my own. I pulled back from the saw, peeling away the guard. A quiet click and near imperceptible hum fought the sound of dropping rain in vain as a scabbard shielded the space between itself and the blade to cordon its insides from the downpour. As I pulled the sword down further, it began to pop intermittently, evaporating striking droplets in an instant. The pops turned to a soft hiss as the rainwater flowed along the exposed blade edge towards the mouth of the scabbard, forming a delicate wisp of steam that mimicked smoke from burnt incense. If only it didn't smell like ozone. The hiss only stopped when I unsheathed the sword fully, returning to quiet popping. The blade itself glistened in the rain, its silver-esque surface reflecting the harsh neon lighting. I flipped the switch on the guard, and for a moment the sword seemed to glow ever so slightly as arcs of electricity snaked across its now ionized air around its surface, jumping from droplet to droplet. As quickly as it began, it ended. The blade returned to its ordinary luster, now sharpened to a vicious monomolecular edge. I craned my neck back to get a better view of the man on the balcony beneath. He glanced at his watch, then slumped his hand to his thigh in frustration, no doubt disappointed in the tardiness of the other mob boss lying decapitated two stories above him. He reached his hand back up and leaned down, placing his head between them. His criminal empire was shattered, his guard slaughtered, every source of Imkong ground to dust. In desperation, he had called out an old contact, hoping to call in a favor for protection, but even that would be no use if they never came. I spun my sword in my arm for a moment, checking the balance, cutting the rain. It was in perfect shape. I stopped, now holding the sword in an inverted grip. I wrapped my other leg around the reining. I slipped my other arm free placing it onto the hilt with an open palm. I looked back at the man below me, still moping, his head still down, the nape of his neck still clearly exposed. There was no possible witness. Perfect. I twisted my body as I hung upside down, orienting myself all the perfect drop. I pointed the tip of the blade at his neck. I let my legs slip loose of the reining, beginning my plunge through the rain. This would be far cleaner death than any he had ever dealt. One swift, meaty squelch, and he slumped over further. No scream, not even a gasp or exhale. The only thing that held him sitting was my sword, slotted through his spine and impaled into the seat beneath. I pulled it free in one swift motion, twisting it in my hand to show the flat side to the rain and let it wash off the small amount of rapidly darkening blue blood. A soft thump, no doubt what was left of him hitting the floor. I didn't look back, instead twisting my blade once more to clean the other side. When it was spotless, I twirled it behind my back and stuck it into the scabbard with a soft thump, and the click of the scabbard's field generator shutting off. I walked to the edge of the balcony, prepared to leap to the base level in my escape. Yet, as I put one foot on the balcony railing, I hesitated... I took my foot off and placed it back on the ground before looking back. The dead mob boss still laid there, but better safe than sorry with a man like him. I intact my holster, beating the mag revolver free and slowly raising it to his head. I pulled the trigger, setting free the insides of his head. 
but it'll remain stuck to the floor in a small, wet clumps of newly formed puddle of blue blood. Nobody would notice the whip-like crack of the revolver against the ambient thunder. Nobody would miss him even if he was identified. He shouldn't have pissed off a persistence hunter. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.